As a kid, I was really scared about going to hell. Like the concept of hell was really frightening. One thing I remember doing is that I took a match and I uh, light it on and I blew, uh, blew the match out and I put it on my arm just to see how it feels. Even it wasn't, it was really hot and I remember thinking this is too painful. And then I imagine, imagine this all over your body forever. And I couldn't even imagine how, how could anybody tolerate it? How could, it, it, it so consumed me that I remember crying one time thinking about me going to hell, or my parents going to hell, and I remember my, my aunt coming to me and asking me why I was crying. And then when I told her, and she, she mentioned that, no, don't worry, hell, most people are never going to go to hell. Hell is for the worst of the worst people. And that calmed me down for a bit until I went to school. This was uh, before school. But, but the teachers in school, in later years, they, they told us that actually most people are going to end up in hell. Even most Muslims are going to go end up in hell. If you missed one prayer, if you missed one day of fasting, um, if you doubted God ever, um, you, you have to pay for it. And I knew I still had a chance because I wasn't an adult, an adult yet and these things were not mandatory for me yet, but I noticed that my parents were not praying, my parents weren't fasting. And I asked my teachers in elementary school, so my my dad, my mom, they're going to burn in hell? And the answer was like, yes, they're going to burn in hell. I tried to argue with them. I was like, um, is there any way I could, like, they're not, they're not going to listen to me. What can I do? Like, well, you, when they die, you could pray the prayers that they missed and fast, do fast on non-Ramadan days for the fasting that they missed. But while you're catching up, they're going to burn in hell until you catch up to all their prayers. And the teacher, actually, I remember, he took a pen and paper and he's like, how old is your mom? How old is your dad? Or let's say they die at this. And he added up all the prayers that I had to do for them not to burn. And like, we both concluded that there's no way I could catch up. So I would have to pay somebody to do the prayers for them so that they could come out of hell. So I like, okay, so I have to get rich. I have to make enough money so I could hire some people to pray the prayers that they miss. So I make sure that my parents don't end up in hell. In Islam, you're without sin until you reach the age of reason. So for boys, that's 15. For girls, that's nine according to what they told us in school. I understand later that some Muslims have a different understanding of what those exact years are, or some people say it's just the age of reason, there's no specific number for it. But our, my understanding was based on what they told us in school, that fif before 15, anything I do is not counted as a sin. Suicide is a sin, but not if I do it before age 15. So I thought, if I kill myself before age 15, there's only one destination for me, heaven. I wanted to make sure I got this right, so I asked my teachers, why wouldn't I just kill myself to make sure I don't go to hell? And the only comeback they had for me for why I shouldn't do that is because if children die, they go to heaven, that's true, but they go to the lowest part of heaven. There are many different levels of heaven. The highest part is for the martyrs, where it's exactly next to Muhammad, where Muhammad is. But if I die as a child, I go to the lowest part of heaven. They say if you earn heaven with good deeds, then you go to a higher level. So that's why I shouldn't kill myself, because, it's, because you could go to a better part of heaven. But I thought, who the fuck cares? I just want to not go to hell. I'm content with the lowest part of heaven. Why would I gamble? Why would I take a chance, even the slightest chance of burning forever, even burning for thousands of, because they told you the smallest amount of sin will get you years and years in hell, and then you go to heaven. I said, I can't take 10 minutes of burning. Years of burning? Forget that. So 
I jumped out of my school window, attempting to kill myself around age 12, to make sure I go to heaven. And I didn't. I wasn't successful. Uh, I remember seeing my dad cry for the first time. I saw my mom going crazy on the ground, and that's the. the she was like, she was, she was so distressed, and my father. What I did to them was so tragic, and I felt so bad that I didn't try it again. I broke both my legs, my left ankle, my left arm, and I fractured my back. Luckily, I didn't cut my spine. I was in a wheelchair and my bed and wheelchair for around seven months. I missed one year of school. When I took Islam more seriously, I started studying it. The, th- the problem is that the concept of hell still stayed with me. Even as a Muslim, my parents were still going to, even though I thought I could avoid hell by now, when I reached 15, I was like, okay, game on. I can't miss a prayer anymore. I can't miss a day of fasting anymore. But my parents were still not practicing Islam. Even though they were Muslim by name, they were not practicing it. And they were going to still end up in hell. And... I remember in, at home, we watched the BBC, we watched Hollywood movies, and always all I could think of, like, that reporter, he's, gonna, he's not a Muslim, he's going to burn in hell forever. That actor that everybody seems to, everybody here in Iran seems to celebrate that guy, but don't they remember that he's going to burn in hell forever? And I'm like, how could all these people burn in hell forever? I decided that I'm going to study other religions. Maybe, maybe they aren't as bad. Maybe they're kind of Muslim light. I told myself, listen, Islam is proven by logic and reason. So I shouldn't be worried about examining Islam through logic and reason, because at the end of the day, I'm going to go come back to this conclusion. The more I look, the more doubtful I got. And I remember actually praying to God. I was scared. I was crying. I was telling God that, you know, I'm going down a path that I'm losing faith in you. And if you're out there, please don't punish me if I ever lose my faith in you. Please, anything, any sign, any evidence, the smallest amount of miracle that you could send me my way, I appreciate that. If you're there, talk to me, say something, do something. I'm losing you. You're the only thing I have. You're my only friend, my only refuge. Talk to me, anything, and nothing. When I lost my faith in God, I decided that even if God is imaginary, I'm still going to talk to him because he was the only thing I had. But I couldn't, once I realized that I'm the the creator of this God that I'm talking to, instead of him being my creator, the conversation became much less meaningful and much less rewarding than it used to be. So my talks with him became less and less and eventually it completely stopped and I called myself an atheist at that I dedicated my life to activism and to fighting religion and dogma in general. So I went looking for other atheists because I was the only atheist I knew. And soon I discovered that there's actually a lot of us out there. And that was very encouraging and I felt like It felt like finding a family that I didn't know I have. And these were, at the beginning, they were just atheists in Iran. And I was surprised to find them, and they were surprised to find me, and we were all surprised to find each other, and we we were all happy to find each other. It was such a great experience, and I thought, this can't be just happening in Iran. 
There must be a lot of other atheists all around the world, and they would benefit from discovering each other as well. So, made a more global platform, and it just grew and grew and grew, and it became now 1.6 million followers worldwide, and still growing. People in the non-Islamic world, they usually are looking at it in a very selfish way. They're not. They're talking about. Danger to them. Islam was dangerous way before any terrorist attack happened here in the West. the The cost of Islam and religion in general, it's not a suicide bomb here and a terrorist attack over there. When you say dangerous. You have to add up all the costs that religions cause, that are much more subtle, much less newsworthy, much less interesting. That a lot of people suffer every day in the Islamic world without us noticing. Let's say a Muslim that is dedicating his entire life to Islam or her entire life to Islam. That doesn't hurt a single other human being. That doesn't preach or influence anybody else's life. We think of that person as somebody that is not causing any harm, but he is causing harm to himself. He has wasted his life to a to a lie. The Muslims that are peaceful are not or moderate. They're not peaceful or moderate. Because they have a reformed version of Islam, they're ignoring Islam. They are they are abandoning Islam. They are Muslim by name. They're not practicing Islam. They're not practicing a reform. They are nice. These are people that are nicer than their own religion. The only way to reform Islam is to get rid of Islam. Because the, any other concept of reform, other than the abandonment of Islam, involves believing in things without evidence. Historical versions of reform in Islam never denied Islam, never denied the Quran as the direct word of God, never denied that Muhammad was an infallible role model. These new reform, Western reform versions of Islam, is something that is never going to happen, and it's actually dangerous because it's suggesting to the West that there is a version of Islam that is not going to harm you. So it's just a politically correct solution that is never going to fly, and it's taking our attention away from the actual movement that is growing, that it does have a chance. That is the ex-Muslim movement. The reform movement is very condescending because it's suggesting to that the Islam people living in the Islamic world are too dumb and too stupid to understand that there is no God. So let's just these dumb people. Let's just hope that they believe in a version of Islam that is not going to harm us because it's too soon for us to even introduce secularism and atheism. But Guess what? Secularism and atheism existed in these countries way before United States was even a country. The first two people that I talked about atheism in Iran in my university became skeptical about the religion within weeks. The, the, there's much higher chance of people abandoning their religion once you show them what the religion stands for. It's it's easier for me to make an argument that hey. Where is the evidence for God? Then to go make a gymnastic argument. Hey, maybe this verse that tells you that you could beat your wife, maybe it doesn't mean you can beat your wife. Try making that argument because it plainly says in black and white that you could beat your wife, that you should beat your wife, and there's a lot of hadith that supports what it actually means. So you have to really think that these people are crazy for you to be able to sell that argument. The only reason why they might buy buy your argument because they are nice people and they're desperate for this verse to mean something else. It's not because your argument for reform makes any sense. The reform movement is treating the Muslim community like children. You're not giving them enough credit you're, that they might actually be reasonable enough to understand that without evidence you can't believe in things. The reform movement is a sugarcoating. 
for for the poison pill of Islam. The only solution to fighting any form of delusion is to provide people with critical thinking skills to understand that what is bullshit and what is fact. And that's what we're trying to do with the ex-Muslim movement. It has a lot more hope. It's growing faster. The reform movement is a fringe group. This is why me and Ali and Yasmin and Faisal, we started a podcast called Secular Jihadists from the Middle East and it's uh, ex-Muslims. And th- this is why I believe in ex-Muslims of North America, the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain and all the other um, ex-Muslim groups that are out there. And I think this is a battle that we're losing. People think that secularism is winning against Islam, but Islam is growing faster. They have much higher presence on social media. They know what they're doing and they're growing. And this is something that we can't afford to get wrong. So betting on the wrong movement against Islamic fundamentalism is going to cost us dearly. And I'm telling you that ex-Muslim movement is where you have to put the fight against Islam, not the reform movement.